I, uh, yeah, so it was a week ago. Um, I think I was walking around Washington, D.C. with my wife looking for a new apartment. And I got this direct message from Alan saying, oh, no, we don't have a keynote speaker anymore. And I said, it's OK. I'll do it. I'll just have Rich make my slides for me, um, which is what I did. So if I don't know, if I don't seem to be talking about what you see behind me, <laughs> it's because Rich made the slides. And we basically did it all this morning. Um, I made the mistake of asking Amy what she would have spoken about and then thought, I will do something like that, instead of just choosing one of the many slide decks that I've done. And really, it was just because I felt bad presenting the same thing to Anthony Eden yet again, because he has seen me do the same presentation so many times. And, and I think he actually asked me on IM, you're not going to do that McDonald's thing again, are you? <laughs> so uh, I will have McDonald's present here just for him, but it won't be the same thing that I usually do. So this is my team, or at least part of it. Um, I asked Amy what she was going to do, and she said, I was going to talk about the business of programming and the fact that programmers don't understand business, and they don't think they need to, and they think it's not an art, and that's stupid, and they're lazy, and you're all a bunch of idiots. So I thought, I can go with that. Um, <laughs> but really, I, I took that idea, and I said, OK, what is it in business that programmers don't understand? Because she gave me a long list of things. Um, you know, like They don't understand sales, and they assume it's easy, then they try to do a product, and they can't sell it for example. They've never read a book about sales. Um, we're, we're in a kind of unique situation, a very unique situation, I have to say. This is my uh, consultancy that uh, Rich Kelmer started many, many years ago, 10 years ago, and I've had the pleasure of working with for uh, several years myself. I was CTO of InfoEther, and we were recently purchased by Living Social. Um, so we're a consultancy that has just been acquired by a product company, which is really interesting. Um, and by interesting, I mean awesome. I said awesome because I'm American, and I think there's some sort of running tally of, of mentions of the word awesome at this conference. <laughs> so why, people keep asking us, why did Living Social acquire you? That seems strange. What Living Social does is uh, local commerce. Specifically, we, we've come out and we've done the, the daily deal thing, so you can sign up for a deal in your city and you can get it for a great price. We're enabling merchants that are local, like mom and pop shops, to have kind of internet scale. So we're doing something that I think is really exciting. And at the backbone of that, really, technology is our differentiator. The picture that you saw on the first slide that I had of InfoEther is by far the best team I've ever had a chance of, I've ever had the opportunity to work with. Now, with the combined team, we've actually doubled their engineering team size. It is that times 100. It's an amazing team. And they understand that. Living Social understands that. They were created by four founders, three of whom are Rails programmers and Ruby programmers. So it's an amazing place to work. Technology is our differentiator. And they just got one of the best Rails and Ruby teams on the planet to help make that happen. But there's another huge differentiator, and it's the thing that I'm most excited about in making this transition. Not because I wasn't excited about it before, but because this has given me a chance to focus on, in my new role as VP of engineering, how do I want to run the engineering organization in Living Social? And what do I want to focus on? And not just the Living Social in, uh, engineering organization, but how do I want us to work with our customers and our custo customers' customers? and really shape the future of the company. And I think the other massive differentiator that we have at Living Social, the, the kind of secret sauce, is caring like crazy. Now, I got this phrase from Gary Vaynerchuk, who just released this book, The Thank You Economy, which I was lucky enough to be able to read a little bit early. Otherwise, I'd still be reading it, because I'm the world's slowest reader. Um, and Gary says this phrase, caring like crazy, over and over and over again. He talks about basically just loving your customers. And if any of you know Gary Vaynerchuk, you know that he seriously means loving your customers. Um, he's an intense guy, but he's an intensely positive guy. I feel that living social as a company, you know, part of what made me excited to join it is that living social doesn't do anything unless it benefits the merchant the customers of the merchant, and Living Social. That's kind of the mantra. So if, if it benefits the merchant, you know, we have to care about the merchant. We're trying to bring up all of these local small players and turn this into something big that they can do and help people make their businesses. It turns out, though, that that's how I've made my career. 
but I've got a pretty, pretty good career in software development. I've kind of, you know, it's worked out pretty well. Um, friends and I joke that it actually took off after I wrote a book about how to do it, which is funny. Um, so my next book is, you know, The Passionate Millionaire. So. <laughs> So the other thing that uh, everyone else is mentioning in this conference is Corey Haynes. Um, <laughs> here's a tweet that Corey did recently. Uh, Contemplating what practices could constitute a list of required practices of modern software development. So you're probably all thinking like unit testing, right? And source control, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Justin Gatlin says, giving a shit. Actually really giving a shit. Knowing the first thing about coding and then giving a shit. And I thought, that is pretty deep. <laughs> Lol. Um, all of this really means service. So service is what this presentation is about. It's the thing that I think programmers don't understand or that understand the least about the business they're in. Who here is in the service industry? All right. Actually, you're all in the service industry, so everyone who didn't raise your hand, you're wrong. Everyone who was sitting next to them, give them a funny look. <laughs> so actually, everybody's in the service industry. Everybody who does anything for anybody else. You might think you make software. You might think that you sell burgers at McDonald's. Uh, <laughs> but really, we all make the same thing. We all make one thing, and it's experiences for the people that we interact with. It's our customers. We make customer experiences. Here's an example. I've got tons of them, but this is one that may be surprising um, in, in the fact that I even remember it. So in September 2005, I was on Pennsylvania Avenue in, in Washington, D.C., and I had to go all the way to Dulles, which is a hellacious, horrible cab ride. Unfortunately, you can't get there on the metro. It's just get in a cab and sit in the back and, of course, text on your phone until you get car sick and almost vomit. So one of those ugly purple cabs come, comes up, and I think, well, that will make the experience special. Um, <laughs> and I get in, and you're not allowed to smoke in the cabs, but it smells like smoke. And there is this old, fussy, grumpy-looking Ethiopian cab driver. Um, and I get in the cab, and I, you know, I'm always kind of talkative to the cab drivers, especially the ones that seem to be from Africa, because they know where all the good restaurants are. And so we're talking a little bit, and then George Bush decides to leave the White House, and everything gets crazy. In Pennsylvania, we're heading toward the White House, the traffic stops, and the guy is standing there, or he's sitting there in traffic, and he sits there for maybe 15 seconds and says, I hate traffic! <laughs> and rather than, rather than act scared, I said, wow, you must not like your job very much. And he said, no, no, actually. And he turned around. He was already moving at this point. He turned around <laughs> and he said, no, 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 I love my job. I hate traffic. My job is to fight the traffic. And I thought, wow, what an amazing piece of career advice. <laughs> but not just that. I had a beautiful time in this hour-long car ride. I didn't even get car sick. Um, and here it is, almost six years later, I'm telling a group of people in another country about this guy. So most cab drivers think that their job is to take you from one place to the next. But I've probably met 50 or 60 that have changed my life in some way, some small way sometimes, some major way sometimes. So in preparing for this talk, and I did a lot of preparation, uh, at least you know that I was considering doing this talk on March 28th. This is how I do presentations now. This is how I get content. I just ask Twitter, and then you guys make the content for me. So I said, uh, you know, what was the best customer service experience you've ever had? And I got all kinds of good answers. There were some that were touching. There were some that's like, there's one up there that says that the guy actually smashed his answering machine with his fist because his girlfriend broke up with him or his ex-girlfriend called and, and the company gave him a new one because of the situation. <laughs> and really, he didn't deserve it at all, you know? 
So there were a lot of little stories like that where companies did extra things that were just not necessary, not expected. And I started pulling all this stuff together and, you know, like categorizing it. And I ran it through all sort of statistical analysis. And I had Jeremy Heinegarter make a Hadoop cluster for me. <laughs> um, and then I couldn't get any of that to work, so I just made this list. <laughs> and this is what we're going to talk about. So I show you this list so that you'll know we're almost done, because um, I know you're all anxious to eat. So when you see gratitude, guess what? It's almost over. Seven values that I think you can use for doing service right, for getting it right. The first one is curiosity. Didn't Rich do a good job with these slides? Thank you, Rich. All right. So you should be curious about who your customer is. Um, I said that I was VP of engineering for Living Social. So who might my customer be? Um, well, the first answer that I have is it's my team. Because someone has to step in and give a shit about each individual member of the team. Someone has to love the team members and love the team and help the people on the team get to where they want to be in life. Because it's my philosophy, 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 it's my philosophy that if a company is not providing actual growth, and I don't mean growth opportunities, I mean actual growth for its employees, then the company is not a sane place to be. The employees should actually leave. So if you're in a place that's not doing that, you should leave. Okay, so my team. The product development organization. So there are people who you know, are deciding what's going to get built and working with us to get it done. We're implementing it. The founders, um, I report to one of the founders, but all of the founders are kind of the, the heads of the company. So you know, those are certainly my customers, the investors in the company, the consumers of our product, the consumers of our service. Those are my customers. And I do think about that. You know, we're in engineering, and you could think like, oh, I'm just building software or whatever. But technology drives our business, so the consumers are my customer. And so are the merchants that are running these deals with us and trying to build their businesses and trying to benefit from us. So if they're not getting a benefit from it, and I notice that they aren't, it's my job to make sure that they do. And the merchant's customers. So, you know, it could be a salon or it could be a restaurant or a bookstore. The people who are coming in and actually doing business there should actually have a good experience. Those are my customers as well. Local business communities. So we're driving local commerce. That's our thing. We want to allow all of these local small business communities to grow and compete with the massive, you know, Walmarts of the world, et cetera. And then, I'm not joking here. Part of my job, I see it, is to serve the economy. We can make a change here. We, as in you know, us programmers, we can certainly screw up the economy, I can tell you that. <laughs> um, but we can make it better. And my company can make it better, and therefore I can make it better. So these are my customers. And the way I think of this now is I've just listed all of these, and some of them I don't touch directly. But it's kind of like we have this chain of service. You know, you have your customers, and your customers, customers, and your customers, 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 et cetera. And you can set off this chain of positive or negative service events. If you do something really great for someone at one point in time, maybe you just give them what they need, you know, like before they need it, um, it can set off a chain of positive things happening and customers being happy and therefore people being happy as they're trying to get things done. You can model this using something called rolled throughput yield. So, uh, Anthony, here's the Six Sigma part of my presentation. Um, I've got McDonald's, I've got Six Sigma. I don't think I'm going to talk about offshore outsourcing, but I'll find a way. Um, so, rolled throughput yield basically is defined as the total yield of a set of processes that are dependent on each other in a chain. It's used in manufacturing, but you know, it's like you have process one, throughput yield, process two, throughput yield, and the whole idea is you, you start off being able to make a certain number of pieces, and in the end you get a certain number of pieces that are actually working. That's roll throughput yield. Same thing applies in service. If I screw up for my customer, or let's say I screw up for a merchant, they're probably going to screw up for their customers. And that's going to create a negative service experience. And maybe it's the customer is trying to go eat lunch, so then they can't get back and do their job. So they're going to screw up for their customer. And so on and so on and so on. It's like a domino effect. So un understanding your customers and being curious about them. Um, once you sort of know who they are, then you need to think about what it's like to be them. You know, understand their perspective. Um, 
I had, I had a positive example of this recently. As I said, in fact, I think it was the exact same day that Alan direct messaged me about coming out here. And it was, we had been going from apartment building to apartment building to apartment building in Washington, D.C. And there seems to be a thing there where if you're going to tour the apartment building, you have to present a photo ID, and then they actually put it in an office where you can't get to it. And then they take you on the tour, and then you have to remember to go get it. And you kind of feel like you're checking into a prison or something. It's really strange. And, um, you know, we were touring some pretty nice apartment buildings. And here we are being toured around like we're, we're criminals. The last one and the one we actually ended up going with, you know, I'm, I'm like, I know the drill. So I, I pull out my wallet. I'm holding my, my ID in my hand. And the guy comes out and meets us. And um, he says, OK, you want a tour? And I said, yeah. And he says, OK, I see you're holding your ID. You can go ahead and put it in your pocket. I trust that because of the fact that you took it out, that's good enough for me. So we're not going to go store it in some stupid office and treat, treat you like a criminal. Um, we walked around. He complimented my clothes. I have to say that was an important part. Um, <laughs> he remembered, you know, he asked a lot of questions about us. He understood what we wanted. We have dogs. He, kn he knew that we actually wanted to move to New Orleans, and we ended up not moving there yet because we're going to D.C. All this sort of stuff, he understood what kind of atmosphere we were looking, out, looking for out of an apartment. You know, it's a place where you have a doorman and all this stuff. The perspective of a customer coming into a place where there's a doorman and you have to, you know, you have key card entry and all that sort of stuff, that sort of customer doesn't want to present an ID and be shuffled around like a criminal. And this guy got it. In fact, when I called him the next day on the phone, he made sure to mention things about New Orleans and you know, all the other stuff we talked about. So it was the right kind of experience. He understood us. Um, the other thing that I've noticed recently is that as and again, really all this stuff on the slides has happened in the last week. It's funny. So um, you need to present a simple, understandable interface to your customers, whoever they are. Um, as a development organization, it's pretty clear that the way to do that is to shield them in a positive way from the technical details of what you do. You know, you don't want to talk to a non-technical person about oh, I have to branch and fork and get or something. You know, they don't know what that is, and it sounds like you're insulting them. <laughs> um, but even if it didn't sound like they were insulting them, it would make them feel stupid because they didn't get it. And your job, in, in whatever it happens to be, is never, ever to let your customers feel stupid because they don't know how to interact with you. So a bad example of this is United Airlines and Con Continental Air Airlines have merged. So that means they're one airline, right? Yeah. Um, every time I get on a United flight, there's some stupid video that plays that says, we're one great airline, et cetera, et cetera. We booked the flights here on United, and they were continental flights. And every time I call, I say, this is, this is just one airline, right? So I'm calling United. That's where I have a customer support thing. And every time, the people on the phone are angry with me. They're like, no, there's two airlines. You have to call continental for that. But it's like, some things I have to call Continental for, some things I don't. The, the, the interface is so complicated that I just can't get it at all. And they treat me like an idiot whenever I, whenever I try. You know, I think, okay, this time I'm going to call the right one, or I'm going to go to the right website. And it's impossible to do it. Um, boarding the flight here, they say, please have your passport and your boarding pass open on the face page so it's ready to present and get in. So I am absolutely perfect. You know, I've got it exactly right. I've got it just so that they can see it. And I hand it over, and the lady takes my boarding pass and lets my passport drop to the floor and acts like I'm an idiot because I didn't get that I was just supposed to show her one and hand her the other one. And she says, no, 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 you're supposed to hand me the, the boarding pass and show me the passport, and, and then waited for me to pick it up so I could get out of the way. Uh, so this was the part where I just vent over the, the travel experience here. Sorry. <laughs> but I, you know, I said you don't want to scare your customers. And in fact, your customers are already scared. Um, everything that you guys do is scary. Well, not everything, but the work that you do is scary. What you're doing right now scares me, in fact. Um, your job is to be like an adventure tour guide. So some people want to do things that might be scary or might even be risky or might even be dangerous. We, as programmers, have a, a way to enable them to do it. 
we know how to do things that they're afraid of. You know, they're barely okay, most of them, with just using the web. We're making web applications. We're doing weird stuff with React and Redis and all these kinds of things. So, you know, imagine you're going on a tour where you get to see lions up close and personal. You probably won't do that by yourself unless you know something about how they work. Yeah? And by how they work, I mean how you interact with a lion so it doesn't eat you, or so that it does, depending on what your goal is. <laughs> so our jobs are to be like an adventure tour guide for our customers, to take them into these scary places, allow them to feel the thrill of you know, whatever it happens to be that we're doing, not to treat them like idiots and make them you know, stay in like a, a rubberized room so they can't mess anything up, but to allow them to get as close as they want to the edge and make it safe for them to do that. Uh, so, no, I made this one. Rich would never have done this because of the color contrast. I don't know. What I've discovered is that programmers have bad taste, and whenever I make slides, none of them like the color scheme. Um, have you seen my Twitter profile page, anyone? So, okay. McDonald's is not a place you go for excellent service especially in Memphis, Tennessee. But it turns out that if it's 5 a.m. in a small town in New Zealand, you might actually be surprised. And Kelly and I went to New Zealand once, and we took a little trip around. And New Zealand from the U.S. is just about the worst jet lag you can have. So we kept waking up at like 4 a.m. starving. Um, so we would just pack up and leave the hotel and get in the car. And one morning, we're just bleary-eyed and starving, and we, we can't find anything except for a drive through McDonald's. So we're like, oh, yeah, McDonald's in a foreign country. That's not OK, usually, but we're going to do it. We pull up to the drive through and it dings, and the guy says, good morning! <laughs> and we had maybe the most pleasant conversation I've ever had with someone in a foreign country in the 30 seconds that we ordered our food. Um, that was 11, 12 years ago, and it still you know, made a difference today, and I still think about that guy. When I'm doing stuff like fixing a bug that is annoying me, or dealing with you know, performance issues, or some icky part of my job that no one expects me to be excited about, I'm not always perfect. Um, in fact, I'm rarely perfect, but I try to remember this. If you provide excellent service where it's unexpected, your expectations are so low that the service experience is exponentially greater. So compassion is the third, if I'm counting right, value. Um, I wrote this book in 2005. This was my first book. I had written a couple of chapters of other people's books, though, so I knew already that writing a book is a horrible thing to put yourself through. And I'm serious. Um, it sucks. Probably several of you have started books and not finished them, because statistically they don't get finished. You start them and you think, wow, this is like being in prison. This is horrible. Until it's done. Then when it's done, it's awesome. So I knew already that what people want is not to write a book. People want to have written a book. <laughs> and uh, when I signed up to do this one, Dave Thomas was the guy I was interacting with from the Pragmatic Bookshelf, and he was an old friend of mine already. He asked me to do the book. And Dave's the kind of guy you just don't want to let him down. You know? So I started thinking really hard about, should I sign up to do this? Should I commit to it? I was one of the first few books that Pragmatic Bookshelf did. So it was really kind of a big deal for me to drop out halfway through it, if I, if I was going to. So what I decided as my guiding factor for writing any book, because I really don't like writing, is if I can help people, if I really, really care about the people that are going to be reading it, all the way through, and I really believe that I can help them, then it's worth doing. So, you know, this, this idea of having compassion for your customers um, really, to me, made the whole job worth doing, and I believe it actually came out in the book. Not, not to brag, it's actually not even bragging, it's humbling, but in the last week now, I think I've gotten like three emails from different people randomly across the planet that say, thank you for changing my life with the second edition of this book. And really, the things I say in the book are not rocket surgery. Um, <laughs> I think what has come through is that caring. So who can you help 
You know, always be thinking about who can I help. In your job, there are people that maybe you're not, you're not directly necessarily being paid to help, but, but if you add them to your sphere, things can be better for them and for you. And maybe the answer is actually you can help everybody. So instead of thinking about who you can help, Derek Sivers in his How to Call Attention to Your Music ebook, which is actually totally worth reading for all of you, even if you're not musicians, says, always think how you can help someone. And let that be how you start conversations with new people. Um, and he also says, always meet at least three new people a week. So the, the way that you do it is you think, I'm going to think of three new people or three new categories of people, maybe in my work or outside of my work, that I want to be able to help or I want to be able to meet. And then I'm going to, to try and figure out what it is I can do that can help them. This is a beautiful way to get to know people. Um, even outside of your job for career development, let's say there's some programmer that's done something that you really admire or there's someone that works in a, a company that you would love to work for. And, uh, you know, you want a way to get to know them. What? Um, <laughs> think about how you could help them and, and come at it that way. A lot of the people that I've met in the industry that are now dear friends and colleagues are people that just emailed me and said, you know, like, that, that code you wrote is shit. I'm going to refactor it for you and help you, you know, that sort of thing. I'm not, that's not the way to do it. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> but this is a good, good thing to do. In fact, the way that I met Dave Thomas which arguably is the most important career-changing thing I ever did, um, because he got me into teaching and writing and everything, is I emailed him and I said, I'd like to augment the Ruby documentation you have on your site with this DRB tutorial that I did. And can I use the templates that you used and the styling? Because it you know, had my style. Dave and I are really good designers. Um, and that started the whole thing. I just emailed him to offer something. Um, so. Always think how you can help someone. Speaking of Dave, in the Pragmatic Programmer, Dave and Andy have you know, one of their little snippets, I think they call them tips, that says, always answer every email that you get. Which kind of sounds stupid. Like, is that really a bullet? And it, one of the you know, major headings in the Pragmatic Programmer, the classic, the computer programming classic, and it is. And the funny thing is, that might be the only one I can remember having read it 10 years ago. Um, I remember thinking it was weird, though, when I first read it. But it's such great advice. Um, and when you're someone like Dave, he did answer my email, you know? Um, in fact, I think that's why I emailed him, because I knew he was going to answer it. <laughs> and you can take this further, because email is antiquated technology. Um, you know, always respond to every tweet if someone tweets at you. Um, last week sometime, Someone tweeted something to me, and I responded with like one word, and they said, oh, sir, thank you for your kindness. I'm not, I'm not used to people replying to me, and they were so excited, and I thought, wow, that's interesting. Um, I got this idea on the tweeting from Gary Vaynerchuk, who has 900,000 Twitter followers or something, and actually tries to respond to every tweet. He also responds to every email, gary at vaynermedia.com. <laughs> But it's beautiful and it's endearing, and I feel like Gary knows me and likes me when he probably has to look up who I am every time he sees my name. That's fine. But my experience in reading his books or watching his videos or you know, anything involving him is better, and I feel better about my relationship with him because he doesn't have to be like that. He's generous. So here's another value. Um, in my Twitter poll, John DeGoes, who has, just for a plug since he helped me, has written a really awesome Scala framework called Blue Eyes. So if anyone wants to do any uh, web programming in Scala, Blue Eyes. Um, he said a Lexus dealership was his be best experience, which was not all that helpful. So I said, in what way? And he said this, the feeling that they do 10 minutes of work to save you one minute of your time. That's really good. That, that is a great way to think about interacting with the people that you're trying to help. Just like let that burn into your brain for a minute. Even if you won't do 10 minutes of work to, for one minute of your customer's time, letting them feel that way is not lying to them. Because if they walk away feeling that way, you've done the right thing. 
On the contrary, as a counterexample, here's GoDaddy. Um, GoDaddy wants to waste 10 minutes of your time when it should really take one minute to do what you're trying to do. Uh, I don't know if any of you have used GoDaddy or if you use it here in the UK, do you? They have some customers, yeah. <laughs> Most of them are with DNS simple. They're all, they're all moving to DNS simple now. Um, and by all, I mean, you know, hundreds of them. <laughs> but when you try to buy something through GoDaddy, you're already a customer. You, you log in, you've been a customer for years, like me, and you say, I'm going to add another domain. And you have to walk through spam after spam after spam. Do you want this? Do you want that? Every single time I've always said, no, I just want the domain registration. Surely they have figured it out by now. I don't want those things. How many times do I have to say, no thanks, uh, no thanks? But they really, they want me to make a mistake, I think. Is that what it is? They want me to say yes, next, or whatever it is. They're treating me like, you know, I'm a prospective customer when I've already made the decision to buy something from them. I, I might already even be, uh, you know, a loyal customer. I don't know how that's possible. Um, Again, last week in Washington, D.C., we needed some stuff from the drugstore, and we went in, and it was CVS drugstore. And they, I was delighted to see that they have automated checkouts, um, because I really don't like interacting with people very much. <laughs> and they did, and so we went to the automated checkout. Now, it took a long time, because we actually had to involve like three employees to get the thing to work. <laughs> um, that's not a joke. And then we finally do it. And to add insult to injury, hurrah, we're clicking go, pay, and it says, would you like a bag? That would be five cents. <laughs> five cents? <laughs> like, really? We just spent maybe $30. Do you really need five more cents? And several seconds of my time and my frustration at you not just giving me a stupid bag. So anyway, I don't know why I'm, again, I've just, I've had a bad week, I guess. Um, <laughs> So another one that you should complain about if, if, your, if your, uh, your employer doesn't do this for you is employee benefits. As a manager of a team again after many years, I'm going back to the things I learned at, this is going to sound strange, but one of the greatest people management companies of the world, GE. That's going to sound crazy because they also do Six Sigma, but it's true that you don't just give the employees what they need to do their job. You might do that if you're in an industry where you know, the employees are just sweeping the floor. And it's OK if they kind of mess that up and you're not paying very much and you know, whatever. They're all wanting to do something else anyway, <laughs> usually. But in a knowledge working kind of field, intentionally go beyond what they need to get the job done. Maybe it's the computers you buy for them. Maybe it's you give them three monitors instead of two, like normal people have. Um, <laughs> you give them benefits that are better than they need, et cetera. So you don't know your customers' businesses better than they do. And this is something that, <laughs> so I told you we were making our slides, uh, you know, Rich and I were making the slides today, and we were at the apartment, luckily for you, because <laughs> otherwise you wouldn't have been able to hear the speaker. So if you haven't seen this damn you autocorrect.com, I'm sorry, um, but you're going to spend hours. <laughs> but you're also going to get a good ab workout from it, from the laughing. So uh, the iPhone thinks it knows what you want better than you do. Uh, for example, I never want to talk about a fir tree when I'm typing a text message. And those laughing have iPhones. Um, <laughs> But the other thing is, imagine, imagine a company like ours that's dealing with merchants in all different types of industries. Imagine we were to go to our customers and say, you know what, we're doing this really well. I know you've had this pizza shop for 40 years or this salon that's been doing great business. You're trying to expand. Let me show you how to run that salon. Or let me show you how to run that pizza shop. Um, or product development people, let me talk to you about how products should be developed. Or, hey, CEO, let me talk to you about how your business should be run, because I know better than you. It drives me insane when companies do this, or when programmers do it to their customers. You, you don't know about your customers' businesses, especially if you're a consultant. 
Hopefully you strive to know about them. Hopefully you get better and better and better. And if you're in a company where you're doing the same thing or the same product or the same domain and you've been there for a while, you better be one of the most knowledgeable people there. Um, but most of the time you aren't. And you have to remember that. Because if it come off as being arrogant, like you know better about the thing your customer is supposed to know than they do, you know, that thing I told you about fear, they're just not going to want to interact with you at all. If, my, if United tells me how I, how I most comfortably want to fly, I will switch to some other airline. You know, if McDonald's tells me, you don't want to eat that, that's going to make you sick, I might actually eat there. Yeah, I would actually eat there for that. Um, then be transparent about what it is you're actually selling, what it is you're actually doing, how you profit. Um, this one doesn't really apply so much to individual programmers, but, you know, if... If I buy something from you, I expect the money that I give you to be the end of the transaction. Um, I don't expect you to be selling my name to a list, for example. Uh, I, don't expect, I don't expect you to be trying to upsell me like GoDaddy does. It's all about just me understanding the transaction with you as a customer. And so we can all kind of take a lesson from that. Now, to bring all of this together, if I sometimes give you a great experience and I sometimes give you a very poor experience, what you're going to remember definitely is the poor experience. There's a saying in statistics that says you can't cross a river using averages because if the average depth is okay to walk through, that doesn't mean that there isn't a 10-foot drop somewhere, you know, if there's a two-foot section. And the same thing is true here. And in fact, if you're inconsistent, it's worse than being kind of consistently mediocre. If you're sometimes great, people will expect great, and then you drop off a cliff and everyone's drowning. I learned some important lessons from this, from this book that I cite in every presentation I ever give, um, which is the E-Myth Revisited. What I always say about this is, is the, maybe the worst title of a book ever other than my job went to India and all I got was this lousy book. <laughs> it's not about e-commerce. It's about entrepreneurial um, thinking, and it's about how small businesses typically fail. And it totally applies to people who aren't trying to run a business. It applies to you as an employee of a company or a consultant or someone trying to run a business, whatever it happens to be that you're doing. The central idea here is that consistency of service is maybe the most important thing you can do. And to achieve consistency, you automate things, you systemize things, you even document so you create a system that's documented that some person can do. Um, he goes so far as to talk about breaking down even your individual job role into an org chart and putting fake names on it and talking about who does what and what the responsibilities are just so that you can make sure every base is covered, which is really great advice for providing consistent service. An example of creating a system for this kind of thing is Zappos.com. Do you have that here in the UK? No. So that's too bad. Um, Amazon has purchased them at this point, but they're kind of still operating the way they always have. Zappos.com sells mostly shoes. That's what I know them for. Um, we, we have bought a lot of shoes from Zappos.com, and my wife tells me that every single time, the shipping is upgraded by one level. So if you say, I want these shoes in three days, then you'll get the next day delivery. It's kind of fishy. I don't know this for a fact, but even if it's not true, it's kind of a cool idea. What if they just actually let you select a lower option and then they always give you the higher option and they pay for that? Because the shipping isn't more expensive than what you would expect, but it's always upgraded every single time, which means every time, and they never tell you this is going to happen. So they've made a system, it seems, out of surprising and delighting you. That's pretty awesome. Uh, at Living Social, I was talking to one of our customer care people recently, because I've been going around talking to all the different people from the company. They're kind of important people in different jobs. And she was telling me that they were watching Twitter, and they post silly stuff on the Living Social account sometimes, like they had gotten this big thing of cupcakes in the office. That's a big thing at Living Social. And they took a picture of it and posted it. And someone responded and said, oh, I would love to have some of those cupcakes. So they actually packaged up the cupcake and found out the person's address and shipped it to them, like, next day. 
I don't even think this was a customer. It was just some random person. All right, have a cupcake. <laughs> Sweetwater.com is another one that I hope that you can use here, but you probably can't because the shipping would be expensive. This is a site that sells musical equipment. Um, when you buy something from them, let's say it's a guitar pick, yeah? A little guitar pick. You will have a music, uh, like a technical sales engineer assigned to you to help you figure out how to use the guitar pick. Um, now you buy a, let's say, acoustic guitar, or no, probably a Les Paul, right? You wouldn't buy an acoustic guitar. You buy a Les Paul. The same exact person says, hey, Chad, thanks for ordering with us again. Let me know if you need help with the Les Paul. In fact, I play guitar. So, uh, you know, I could talk to you about, like, what amp settings work well for me. I can talk to you about how these pickups work on different pedals. And it's like, okay, cool. Five years later, order some sort of USB audio device to plug it into your computer. Same person emails you back. And it's not that it's just, like, you know, Mark from Living Social, who's actually a bunch of people, you know, across the globe at a call center. There's actually a guy named Mark. Um, did I say Living Social from Sweetwater? <laughs> um, we have a market Living Social, you know. It's an easy mistake to make. Um, it's actually him. You can call him, you can talk to him. He has the same voice every time. <laughs> so it's amazing. And people who do music stuff, they know about you know, this, this aspect. Music software and equipment is actually very hard to use. And that's how they knew this would make sense. Um, whenever you start interfacing computers together especially. And this is a high-end business because that, that Gibson Les Paul there probably costs a lot of money. You know, it's probably a couple thousand dollars, could be a little more or less, but it's nice to have that kind of personalized, focused stuff. I mean, they might even say, um, are you sure you want this? Because last time you bought that, they're not compatible. So I think maybe you run a Mac from what you've bought in the past and this is a Windows thing. So are you sure? Or did you get a Windows computer? That's pretty amazing. You ever had a site do that for you? I doubt it. So you can, you can create a system out of learning from your customers, which is what I was just talking about. You know, what does the customer, what computer do they probably use? What kind of music do they seem to do? Can I make some decisions about how to help them more based on that? What are the sorts of questions they're always asking? Is that my fault that I didn't already tell them the answer? or I didn't already guide them to the right place. Um, what sort of problems are they having with the, the actual interactions with what I do? Do I keep making the same mistake over and over? Or does my team keep making the same mistake over and over, such that it's not trackable? You know, I don't know that so-and-so already made this mistake last week and I'm doing it again. So build in the systems, whatever they might have to be. Sometimes they can be automated, sometimes they can be checklists. Whatever, but build systems so that you learn as you move, and you're learning specifically about service. And then the final point, I told you when you saw gratitude that we'll almost be done, so you can all wake up now, take a deep breath. Gratitude. Customers provide your jobs, always. Always, 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 because if you don't have any customers, then you don't have any work to do. You're not providing anything, unless you're your own customer, and that's kind of a weird thing. You know, then you don't really care, because you've got enough money for that. So you need to treat customers with a sort of reverence, you know, like a, there's something sacred about having a customer, about having that relationship. Even if you think your customer is a putz, you know, you can't think that. You can't and you should not think that, because Maybe in their personal lives they are. Maybe there's some aspect of them that you don't like, but the fact that they are your customer and you have that connection, you need to respect that connection. And you need to be thankful for that connection. So say thank you. Do it as often as you can without them thinking you're insane. <laughs> and do it in different ways. Sometimes do it by giving them a little extra or, you know, you work a little at night sometime because there's something you know that they want that you've not been able to provide them, and you're not necessarily on the hook to provide them, but just do it. That's a way of saying thank you. And then I think the most important piece of this caring like crazy goal that I have 
in my new job and therefore in my new life here, is to kill cynicism wherever I can. And if you think about it, cynicism is actually not ever a good thing. You know, in your workplaces, you might sit around joking about the stupid decisions that the business made. Um, you might talk about the crappy test suite or the bad code that some other guy made or, you know, the, the hideous marketing campaign that you think is gross that your company is rolling out, whatever it happens to be. But rather than be cynical about that stuff, why don't you just fix it? Cynicism is laziness. Um, and so an example of me being cynical, I hate Git. I hate the Git source control tool. Thank you very much, Stephen. <laughs> See, I have plants. I even know their names. Stephen Baker, everyone. Um, I hate Git. I'm getting used to it. Getting used to it. Um, and I'm tempted to always tweet stuff about, well, Git sucks. And it's, it's like maybe the worst user interface of any piece of software ever created and that kind of thing. Uh, Chris Wanstroth, on the other hand, now he likes Git, probably. He's one of the founders of GitHub. <laughs> by, by this point, he might not like it either. I don't know. But he likes the result. Um, there was a tweet, because you know, all I do is interact with people via Twitter. Uh, there was a tweet, I don't know, it was like 2007 sometime, struggling with getting Git, some Git server thing working right. Very frustrated. Something like that. So I'm sure I would have been really frustrated too because it was not hard. It was not easy to set up. It really kind of sucks. But Chris, instead of just acting like a jerk and writing a blog post to get, you know, to get his frustration out, started a company and completely changed his and a bunch of other people's lives. So that's the, the difference. That's the opposite of cynicism. So here they are, curiosity, empathy, compassion, generosity, humility, consistency, gratitude. It's all common sense. I apologize for that. Um, but hopefully the focus has helped you think about it in the light of what you do. Why does this matter? Because you can improve people's lives. The taxi driver that I told you about from 2005, September, on Pennsylvania Avenue improved my life. I have retold that story many times. Now, he didn't change my life in any massive way, but clearly he did in, in enough of a way that I would bother to mention it here in front of a bunch of people. Um, I've now retold it to you, and it may have had effect on, on you, right? When you have these positive service experiences, you will retell them. It will change the way you feel. It spreads. And the way that this works is it's kind of like um, we have a, a sales team internally that, you know, it's like a commission sales team. And the way life is as a salesperson is you kind of have like your bread and butter sales that just go and go and go and you kind of get the same numbers all the time. And every once in a while you come up with a deal that's just awesome. Bam! You get a huge payout. But the thing that this pays is passion. Because passion for what you do is a renewable resource, but you actually have to work to renew it. Um, I have made mistakes and not worked to renew it and run out before. And that caused me to be pretty sucky for about a year. But now I've, I've figured it out. And I've done this kind of stuff and it has built me back up. Um, watching the Twitter stream from this conference and talking to people in person, I know that many of these presentations have changed lives here just in these two days, which is pretty amazing to think about. Um, I was just in Kiwi's career health check talk, and I'm pretty sure that there are a lot of people that are going to walk away and have actionable stuff to do there, and they're thinking differently. So you can change people's lives, and it is beneficial to you. So thank you very much. It has been a pleasure. <laughs>